argued with uh, with Rebecca and uh, the others that there should be at least some point today where you could simply pick each other's brains in a big group because there's so many clever people here. My only role here is I'm going to chair, and although there is a big theme of democracy going on today, I want you to know that I will be fascistic on the point of, uh, of, of, of good questions. Um, the goal here is that people think of questions that they themselves really personally care about, about research and your own fate, your own needs, your own organisations. These shouldn't be sort of theoretical questions, these should be like things I need to solve. Um, as a, 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 to quote a, a friend of mine, for anybody who doesn't know in this situation, a, a question is an interrogative statement that ends with a question mark. Um, and uh, and I, will, I, will, I will jump on people who appear to be making speeches rather than questions. Um, I have put only some seeds of ideas here. Um, these are merely to, to, to sort of um, uh, whet your appetites. Um, I hope that over the course of 30, 40 minutes, we might maybe get through seven, eight kind of good, interesting little mini debates. And I am not proposing to answer any of these questions. I will, my, zip, my lips will be zipped. It is for you across the room to put your hands up and go, I have a view, I have an answer, I have a theory. I am just timekeeping and I am chair. So, um, would anyone like to begin with any question? I see one immediately at the back. Gemma, do you want to give that to Frank? Um, I have a question. Do you want to do the intro as well? Sure. Just so. uh, Frank Perrin, I'm the founder and director of the Indigo Trust, and we fund lots of civic protection projects around the world. Um, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about the we see lots of civic tech projects fail, not because they weren't good, but because no one knew they existed. Um, for anyone running a project, um, what's the problem in applying for marketing budget? Is it that you think funders won't give you the money, or you don't think it's your responsibility to market? And how can we look at that from a research perspective? So. The, the, the queue now is for anyone who would uh, like to uh, go and answer it. So, and please in, just give a one word intro when you're saying who you are. Thank you for the question. Eric Barrett from uh, Jumpstart Georgia. Georgia is a country. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Um, our experience is that when we've requested funds specifically for social media advertising, which seems to be the most effective way of reaching our target audiences, uh, we get turned down. Um, and in addition to that, when we request funds for midterm evaluations uh, of impact in order to augment a project halfway through, that often gets pulled out as unnecessary when we think it's vital, um, not to mention including post-project evaluations as well. Um, with Civic Tech, we often find that the, the monitoring and evaluation seems to be a, a, a take on for donors that is unnecessary. Um, and I would like to continue posing a question in regards to that. How do we speak to donors to communicate to them the importance of adding evaluation and impact into the projects? So just sticking on the first question and building on the second, anyone who would like to kind of to pick so Oscar? Uh, Oscar from Mexico. Um, so I think we've realized that it depends who you're talking to. So if you if your tool is for a niche, like you're giving tools to other organizations, you probably just need to like communicate effectively between like the, the that group. Um, otherwise, uh, what we found out is that we uh, we just sort of bootstrap all our communications and we hired someone specifically for that uh, because we figured out that was very important. It's n it doesn't come uh, via the funding. We haven't uh, got to that part, but uh, I think it would be really interesting to talk about that. Any more on, on this one? We'll do a couple more answers and then move on to the next question. So, um, uh, yeah, and then over there. Uh, I'm here from Belgium. Um, we often or almost uh, always work together with media uh, to establish this and we see a huge impact of the different projects so we we'll cooperate with uh, big media players so that for us is an important ingredient to get it uh, right. Uh, do you want to pass it to Sean and then to the back? Sean from, from my SMS. Um, 
Advertising for us ends up being one part of a larger problem, which is getting earned income from the work and explaining earned income as separate from or, or a complement to kind of the grant funded work that we normally do. For us, getting more users is great, um, but getting more users in a way that validates an increasing flow of revenue makes a, a much bigger difference. So I would say that advertising is one part of it, but for us it would also be a facilitated business planning process where the activities that, that the organization's undertaking also drive a, a greater stream of revenue and uh, less ongoing dependence on donors. Uh, hi, I'm Anna from Poland. Uh, I see two points where we sometimes should change our philosophy about promoting our projects. First thing is like we uh, make a lot of work to open uh, data and to give tools to the citizens and citizens usually are just lazy and they do not use these tools. We also need to show some interesting conclusions, examples and analyze this, tool, this data and show just conclusions. And the second uh, is also um, also need uh, some change of thinking of uh, our donors. It's like uh, we all uh, we always want to have uh, good results on our website. Like we we want traffic on our website, and we don't make work to uh, to publish uh, <coughs> something in med on media. And we do not count these uh, these people who uh, read or who see. Um, our publications in media and this also is because our donors uh, want us to show the traffic on the website not somewhere other place. I'm going to take my chair's prerogative and ask for an, a new question on something else. So, uh, Catherine Batner? I wrote it down, Tom, so I'd be very oh. concise. Just yeah, really good. Um, so I've been hearing this morning and Luke, uh, where's Luke from Australia? Is he in here? Okay, yeah, you highlighted this tension between uh, academic research models and the sort of iterative data-driven model that you saw in use in the GDS. So I just think that's an interesting tension. And so the question is, um, how do we develop robust methodologies that are both rigorous but also timely and agile and can be implemented into our current work streams instead of running alongside? Uh, academic time scale doesn't work for the kind of work that, that we do. Any answers? So um, there was one here and then one of the um, I think this is a really great question and although I certainly don't have most of the answers on this, I think some of it would be making these tools <laughs> scalable, so even if on an academic time scale the development of it might be quite long term, once it's actually implemented in you know, 30 different projects or something, the actual implementation could be very short and work on the time scale of an organisation, so if those tools are somewhat standardised, the development process won't be quite so harsh on for the uh, actual project. And then uh, there's someone o o over there. Um, one answer to your question, Catherine, is uh, that you get Jonathan to do it because he can do anything in SPSS in about two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, my name's Martin um, from Brighton. And um, well, one way is uh, sort of a, a, an evaluation uh, sort of framework to look at sort of testing <coughs> models right from the beginning. And uh, so there's, I think, World Bank recently supported a, um, a guide on this, a sort of practical guide, which I've got some leaflets about, um, which is how to integrate this sort of research and evaluation from the beginning. And I think to the gentleman from Georgia about actually doing that. And if you if you integrate it into the sort of product development stage, it's, it's more difficult for a funder to say, oh, cut that, because it's sort of integ integral to the whole initiative. And I think that's a sort of a practical technique depending on the openness to the funder about how open they are to sort of m and &E. But I think right from the beginning is the critical thing so that it doesn't get cut, so you can do that sort of iterative development. All right, ne next up is, um, is William at the back, but I want to point out the gender balance in the answers is bad, so uh, <laughs> please. I, 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 not happens. for the first time, I apologize for my gender. <laughs> um, uh, William Perrin from uh, Indigo Trust and talk about local. We, we developed, and it, we faced this problem evaluating a series of interventions in community websites for the Carnegie UK Trust, the, UK branch of the American Philanthropy Organization. Um, and one thing I was determined to do was not to try and reduce it just to data. Um, it has um, the impact, societal impact has a very strong uh, qualitative component uh, that you can only really get down to by going out and interviewing people about what they think the impact of the project has been. 
Um, that doesn't always fit with some people's lust for data, but on many of these projects, it's absolutely bonkers just to take a data-driven approach because there isn't enough. You cannot really measure societal impact through data alone, except in very rare circumstances. So we constructed an evaluation framework um, that was heavily uh, qual and quant um, that for, for funders that they were very pleased with because they bought the argument that these are relatively small projects. Um, quantitative work is actually quite bogus um, on sample sizes this small. Um, I'm looking for a hand that doesn't have male pattern balding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jessica from Zalendo. Um, I would like to comment from a practitioner perspective. I think um, all the academia coming out to us uh, many times don't factor in that they are the list of our priorities. And so if they want to, us to consider them in our work, then they should also factor us in right from when they're writing. Uh, say, is this a, a partnership that you'd like to be part of? Uh, we want to do this for a number of years so that also we can actually see the return on investment for the time that we are putting in. Um, a lot of times I get university students uh, and I actually turn them down. I usually tell them, if I can't see what your work is going to have, impact is going to have on my work, no, I, I refuse interviews. Mm. Uh, sorry, uh, do you want to just start talking? Yeah. Um, just following on from... Um, question earlier about uh, research and development teams, I'm really interested to kind of take that question and target it. If there's anyone here who is a developer who has gone from not doing any research to doing research in their team, I would really love to hear from you. So if there's anyone, you know, join in now, please. I'll take your microphone. My name is Lisa. I work at GDS. Um, I think it's really important that we don't conflate um, kind of social research with design research. There are different kinds of research. They require different kinds of methodologies. Um, at GDS, the vast majority of the work that we're doing at the moment is design research. So we're working with citizens to try to make services that work better for them. Um, that's really different to measuring impact across a whole population. So you use very different tools. I don't think you can measure impact across a whole population in an agile way, but you can certainly do design research in an agile way. So you need to think about what actually is the research question and what's the right kind of research, and then you can think about whether or not you should get an academic um, to do a larger scale piece or whether you should get a researcher to work closely with your team to help you improve the thing that you're making really quickly. Thank you very much. Um, uh, a new qu uh, is there a new question from the, the room? Um, no, no, like, um, how about a um, gentleman right at the back? Yeah. Yes, please. James, Hi, James McKinney of Open North. Um, so my question is uh, about methodology. So a frequent methodology is you have a control group, an experimental group, and hopefully at the end of it, the experimental group is more engaged than they were before. Um, but I'm wondering about um, like some of the influences on that control group that might make them less engaged, which isn't typically measurable within the time frame of the uh, experiment. Like Chris Case was mentioning earlier, the influence of money in politics is actively disengaging people. And so the question is about uh, the net impact of our civic tech. If uh, more people are becoming disengaged than we're capable of re-engaging through tools, well, shouldn't we be measuring the net and not just the like incremental difference on our experimental groups? Is that a question? Yeah, like how, well, how would, might you design that into your methodology? Oh, a methodology question. <laughs> Shelly. <laughs> so um, there could be problems with the control. There could be problems with the control group. I, I see the issue that you are you're raising. Um, I think the point is to measure your experimental group at multiple points in time and to also assess that to see if they are changing because your control group may be influenced by other factors, but your experimental group should be affected by the technology that they are being exposed to. Does that answer your question? Yeah, partly. I sense that many people were flummoxed by the question, so I might move on to the, <laughs> on, on to the, on to a new one. Um, so, uh, thanks, Hand. Uh, us. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I have a quiet voice, uh, but Mike. Um, so, I just wanted to pick up on the engagement side, if I understood that bit right, um, because I think, in a way, it sort of. 
uh, reads back to what I wondered about the conference as I was uh, preparing to do talk this morning, uh, which is our definitions around civic and engagement and participation. Um, and this came up in the session um, in the other room. And I wondered, you know, sort of off the back of your question, to ask another question, which is really what are people understanding and conceptualizing defining civic as being? So um, I think it's interesting to say people aren't participating and, uh, you know, are we looking at sort of trying to get them to participate using tools? Yeah, that's one way of looking at it. But the second way of looking at it might be, um, you know, are we going to the right places to where people are trying to engage and express themselves as citizens? Um, so, you know, other aspects that are, might be more con constructive in some ways, like volunteering, participating in civic life in other ways. Um, so I wonder, yeah, it's a question about definition. What, what do other people define civic as? Any strong views? room full of civic technologists with no views on the meaning of civic. This is a bombshell. Well, I'll say that um, I, what I think we put too much focus on, or we, it's often implicit in the way we talk about this work, is that civic equals voting, and that that is the most important or the most central act. And if people aren't voting, they're somehow not civically engaged. Um, and I think that's a real failing of the research. I bet if you looked at the indicators in all of Shelley's studies, one of the major ones that we're looking at is you know, going up or down is voting. Um, and it's just, it's maybe necessary, but insufficient. Particularly, you know, in well, how, do we, how do we judge this work in non-democracies? Do we just ignore non-democracies altogether when it comes to citizen participation? So that isn't an answer, but it's what it isn't. Uh, Brett? <coughs> just, just to come back to this point. In, in other contexts, such as Latin America, Asia, Africa, Civic technology is not about voting. I mean, it's mostly about engagement with public services. It's mostly about engagement with other kind of actors uh, rather than politicians. So I think that I, I'm, I, I just quickly coming back to this because if the usual defi definition in American context of civic tech is voting, then I think we should kind of make the point to broaden this definition to other kind of interactions with the, with the state or with the government or so on. Any more views on that, or any totally? Is that? Do you want to come? Can I respond on it? <laughs> Just because I. So, hello, room of civic people. I feel a bit cheated. I want some more definitions. But uh, my tentative, my tentative uh, uh, sort of thoughts on it are that it's to me involvement of um, people in the decisions that affect their lives, and those decisions are um, sort of related to an institution. Sometimes that's government. Sometimes you express it through voting. Um, that happens once every four or five years, um, if you're lucky enough to live in a democracy. So maybe we ought to be looking at other ways um, that people express themselves and trying to sort of define this a bit better. So. Whoa, suddenly loads of things. So you hear <laughs> and, uh, so. Um, Hi, I think just based on that definition, one thing we've started observing, at least in Kenya, is um, when that element of how it affects your life as, 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 as related to an institution then is reduced to a personal thing. We're like, well, I can't think of this huge number that is about taxes that are being misappropriated or whatever. So it comes back down to self self preservation. So is that, and I, I think it goes back to what someone raised earlier about um, opting out altogether, because in the grander scheme of it being about institutions, um, that metric becomes problematic. Or when just people want to beam their thoughts, but not be tied down to saying this is. In, in reference to trying to get an institution to be held accountable. How, the disillusionment that plays in that, especially from the citizen side, is really interesting. And I think it's partly why there isn't a standardized definition, uh, because it's very contextual and it rolls with different events and different moods, I guess. Yeah, at least from my observation. Should we just start talking? Yeah, okay, uh, I'll, I'll read it, because it's a, a definition. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, digital citizen, oh yeah. Digital citizen engagement is defined as the use of new media, digital information and communication technologies to create or enhance the communication channels that facilitate the interaction between citizens and governments or the private sector. I think the private sector is an important uh, addition to civic engagement. I dare to venture here that the, the definition that is going to stick is actually one that will be made by people in this room who do good work. <laughs> 
that is, that's the way that we learn to use words. And so um, the uh, we can't resolve this now, but I'll have like a couple more, and then definitely a new question. So um, James, um, and then a very enthusiastic question. So the definition kind of runs counter to the previous comment about um, whether opting out should be the tools that help people opt out of uh, a political system should be considered as part of civic tech. Because right now, most civic tech tools about allowing people, giving people more information about the current system they're living in, allowing them to engage with that system better. But if, say, like nextdoor.com lets helps people engage with their neighbors more, so instead of relying on their government doing things better for them, maybe they just uh, set up these like local communities to help each other. But is Nextdoor considered civic tech if the definition is about empowering people to affect institutions? And then uh, Chris, and then I do feel we should move on because this is an endless conversation. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, but so just to say that there's, you need to really differentiate back to Catherine's point about uh, there's part of civic activity that is about trying to influence the decisions that other people are making about your life. But the other piece that I think is growing much more quickly is civic tech around actually doing things, around becoming an actor yourself about. Um, becoming a problem solver, not trying to influence people to do things on your behalf, but the, the real tools that have been created that have been incredibly successful have been about empowering people to become civic actors themselves, not lobbying other people to make better decisions on their behalf. So I mean, the def that, that definition I think is sort of only describes really the one side, which is using these tools to influence other people to make decisions, and there's a whole other part of this work that is about empowering people to become actors in and of themselves. Well, maybe next year there will be three rival research conferences with three on the same day with three rival definitions. <laughs> um, uh, so a different a different question from somebody. So thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Gail Manster. I'm a design researcher at the uh, Royal College of Art, and we recently did a project where we used a community mapping platform um, to engage people in local issues, and found that well, what we found was that it didn't really work as an alternative to traditional engagement methods, but needed to be part of um, a wider engagement process, so still using meetings and face-to-face -face conversations and workshops. So I wondered whether people have examples of how other civic tech has been integrated into more traditional community engagement processes. Some of this might be repeating a bit from my actual talk this morning, but I think that we've also really, really found that it's the offline things that matter. And so we found that sometimes, for example, technology can be used to amplify the voice of people that aren't offline. So quite a few of the groups we work with, they'll go and they'll get testimonies from the communities that they're working with, and they'll hold interviews and meetings with them. But it might be that they, for example, can use social media to amplify the message so that it reach, po reaches politicians, or it might be that they can collect all of the reports coming in through a particular reporting platform, and then they can use that to negotiate with political leaders, for example, and say, okay, there's evidence here. And I completely agree with you. I think we found again and again that it's the offline things that matter, but it's actually the tech that's kind of amplifying the message and enabling it ena it enabling information to be exchanged at a lower cost and faster and a greater scale, but that it is really this offline work that matters. And often that's individual relationships, which is quite e hard to quantify, but often it is kind of, they've met somebody in government that is interested <coughs> in this work and is willing to talk to them about things. And again, I think it's about showing government how you can actually benefit them, or it might be government, it might be others, but sometimes saying, look, we found out that through using this platform, actually one of your subcontractors isn't working too well, and you can now go to them, or, you know, we can actually see that citizens are interested in this, what are you going to do about it? So it's often kind of finding what's interesting for them. Hey, uh, just an example I was talking about yesterday,
pull this slightly closer to, to research, especially because we're, we're almost out of time. And what I would really like to know is whether anyone has any questions about any, re specifically about any research projects that they think that they will be doing, might be doing in the next six months, where they just would like some advice from other people. So, um, Becky. Um, hello, my name is Becky Hogg. I am uh, producing a piece of research that I hope to publish in October. It's not a piece of academic research, I would call it grey literature. And I'm interested in uh, talking to anyone who has um, a story to tell about uh, the impact at scale of open government data. Um, please find me if you don't want to me directly. Thank you. All right, that doesn't need a uh, long answer, I guess. So, um, there were some more hands over here. Sorry, I just, um, this is <coughs> Hello. Uh, uh, I'm Simon Lindgren. I'm a professor of sociology. Uh, do research on digital activism and things like that. And I think it's really inspiring to hear the, the talks this morning because they were about uh, the need for knowledge uh, about the actual impact of such initiatives. And I say from the perspective of internet research, there's a huge gap between the real world and the theories that guests it's going to be awesome or it's going to be a catastrophe with these technologies. So um, basically to make this into a question, I would say also with Shelley's talk, I think it, it shows that the shortcomings of those studies have to do with the fact that there's a gap between what actually happens and the researchers doing this guesswork. So, so in my research group, we tried to bridge this actually. So I saw your, your little buffet of questions there. <laughs> would anyone like to, if anyone would like to partner on doing studies, we're actually looking for, for cases to, to follow and to study. So you can, you can look up my research group, my publications and so on, and I'd be happy to do discussions mm -hmm. as well. So to make this into a question, uh, yeah. do people feel from the perspective of uh, civic technology projects that this gap exists as well? Um, and um, sorry, that, can you put your hands right up at the back? So, so Martin, and then the lady at the far corner, and then that's probably. Have we time for that? Yeah. yeah, that'll be time after that. Okay, so I, I have the feeling that doing iterative user experience design, that integrating interviews during the design process, it's very important. So I wanted to know if you share that feeling, and I wanted to invite you all to include this process in your research and in your project, because I see many people are talking about doing research separate from development. I, I don't think that's very, I don't know. <coughs> this is one of the common themes in this session. And then the last question. I mean. Hi, I'm Surabhi, and I work on something called Gali Gali in Kathmandu in Nepal. And we're in the initial stages of setting up a research project that works on uh, what are the infrastructural issues, say, in a really small locality, right? And how do people complain about it? So you have your citizens, you have your neighborhood associations, and then you have the ward offices. So how do people complain, and how does the information flow? So what are the channels for the flow, and who are the different actors involved? Uh, so if anyone has any sort of methodological advice on how to set up this research, that would be very valuable. And then the next step we want to add to that is once you know what those networks already are, where can something like crowdsourcing or civic tech or any other sort of digital, non-digital technology help that process. So I suppose there's two pieces to it, and any advice on any of those pieces would be appreciated. Right, I think that that is it. Uh, Gemma, do you want to say anything about sort of what comes next? Um, so now it's lunchtime, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be that announcement. <laughs>